Today we are analyzing Fortune Brands Home and Security, ticker FBHS. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. They have a market cap of $7.9 billion, enterprise value of $10.3 billion. So you can see about $2 billion in net debt on this business. That's about 20% of the overall enterprise value. Not as, It's a significant amount of debt for a business of this size. You have building products industries. So they provide home and security products for residential home repair, remodeling, new construction security applications. So they have plumbing, outdoors and security, and cabinets. So the plumbing segment manufactures, assembles, and sells faucets, kitchen sinks, and waste disposals. So here are the brands, and I've heard of a few of these. We have Moen, Roll, Rio Bell, Victoria, Parent and Row, and Shaw's brands. I think I've actually had some Moen faucets myself. Um, looks like it's like a worldwide business. Um, has its own sales force and independent manufacturing reps. So the outdoor and security segment has fiberglass, steel entry door systems under the Therma True brand, Storm and Security is under Larson brand, Fever and brand, and the Fipon brand. And then it also manufactures um, locks, safes, and safety devices, Sentry Safe brand. So pretty interesting. They have a cabinet segment as well, which has the AOK, Diamond Brands, Homecrest, Kitchencraft, Omega, and Eve brands. Anytime you can brand something, it offers you the ability to get slightly higher returns than you would in a non-branded segment. So I always like investing in branded businesses. That is a positive sign that we see here. Now the return on invested capital chart, I'm gonna ignore this 2009 number because the data doesn't look like we have a full data set at 00%, but you clearly lost money in 2010. That is a concern, you lost money in 2011. So two years of losses here. Um, but starting in 2012, it looks like we've been profitable for about a decade straight. Now, one thing that I see that's interesting here immediately, though, is that each and every year, the change from year to year is very slow. And when there's less volatility in the numbers, that tends to be a positive sign. You also see here that you don't have... Um, cyclicality. This isn't cyclical, cyclical at all. It's a pretty steady growth rate here. So 2012, 4.5%, 8%, 5.3%, 9%, 11%, 11%, 9%, 9%, 10%, 13%. The other thing that I like here is this steady improvement. We've steadily improved the returns on invested capital over time, and now we're getting into the double digit range. I really like to see 10% plus return on invested capital, and we're starting to improve to that point and beyond. It's a very interesting way for this business to operate. Um, return on median returns 10 year, you have basically your 10% return invested capital hitting right at the mark I like to see for potential investments, 16.7% on the return on equity side. That's a very good number. And of course they're getting that boost because they are taking on some debt leverage. On the actual margins, they're operating a pretty low margin business. This would have to be a high turns business in order to get good returns invested capital. So you can sell at 35% gross profit margins, 10% pre-tax income, as long as you can then turn over your inventory pretty quickly to allow you to get good returns on invested capital. Growth rates are respectable, um, but not high. You have 8.7% revenue growth, 8% asset growth, but 16% free cash flow growth. Overall, you'd like slightly higher numbers, but I can work, certainly work at an 8% revenue growth number. Now, where it starts to get really interesting though is although this is all telling me this is a relatively high quality business um, or maybe an average business transitioning into a high quality business because you've seen these steadily return, improving returns on invested capital, you're actually priced very, very reasonably. PE of 10 is is an attractive price for business. I really like to buy companies at a PE of 15 or less. And when I can see a PE of 10, I get excited. Earnings per share, especially when you look at the growth over the last decade, you've gone from 71 cents in EPS to $5.54. You've basically 8x your EPS over the course of a decade. And to get that at a PE of 10 is very attractive. Now, your revenue has almost, you know, has more than doubled from 3.1 billion to 7.6 billion, but it's not been as you know, stark of a difference as the EPS growth. What that means is you're going to be getting some increases in operating leverage here. And you can see it all the way down the balance, all the way down the income statement here. So you, you know, went from 3.1 to 7.6 billion. So you've basically doubled 
your revenue with a little bit more, but you've almost tripled your gross profit from 1 billion to 2.7 billion. So you can already see some improvement in the operating leverage. You see that 33% mar gross margin going to 36% gross margin there. And likewise, you can see the growth in the operating margin going from 5.1% to 14.5%. That's showing you what's happening here with your operating profit going from basically break even 161 million to 1.1 billion over the course of a decade, getting again that like seven per X growth in your operating profit, even though you've only doubled your revenue. Now, you're not gonna repeat this. You're not gonna see a tripling of the operating margin going forward because your gross profit margin's only 36%. So you can't get this up to 45%. It could mean that some of our operating leverage has kind of like already been achieved. We shouldn't expect that much more, but maybe there's a little bit more that we can achieve and put these push these numbers closer to 20%. But it does show you kind of how you've gotten that EPS growing faster than previously. So that we have, so we have this price here of $65 a share, um, $64 a share. You're earning five, six dollars here. Um, I'm wondering if they've earned six dollars in the trailing 12 months. We're going to see at the income statement. I kind of want to correlate those numbers. You can also see that they've been paying out a dividend of about 20% of their EPS. So you're achieving this growth rate while receiving 20% of that money back in a dividend. Here's, you know, you're talking about like a 2% yield there, 2% yield on top of your 8% growth. You start talking about 10% plus returns very, very quickly. And at, once you get in the double digit returns for shareholders, it becomes an exciting potential investment. If you're enjoying this video supplier, please hit that like button and I will go to the income statement next. So our SGNA has basically doubled, but again, your gross profit more than doubled. That allowed you to get some leverage here on the operating profit line. Very good sign there that can happen a lot with businesses that are manufacturing things. If they're able to grow their revenue without having to increase their manufacturing facilities too much, you can start to see that operating leverage. You also see that they've bought back their shares. They started with 166 million shares outstanding. They've gone to 140 million shares outstanding. So they've gone, you know, basically bought back 15 to 20% of their shares outstanding in the course of a decade, which is pretty good. Adds an extra one to 2% to your EPS growth, higher than what your net income growth would show on its own. Your 12 12 months is a little higher. It's not actually at the $6 range on EPS, but you can see you know you have $5.65. You compare that back to this number here. And of course you get to this PE ratio that's probably a little closer to like 12 to 13, maybe 12. But again, that's a pretty reasonable price. You're talking about an 8% earnings yield. You get 8% to 9% growth. You're getting an extra one to 2% from EPS growth because you have buybacks. You get an extra 2% from um, your dividends. And now you're starting talking about like, well, maybe I'm in range for something like, 10, 12, 13% growth in terms of a shareholder return. And that becomes really attractive because that's market beating type returns. Anytime I can start to see market beating type returns, especially on a low price starting price, like a PE of 10, that gets really exciting because it means my risk is relatively low um, as well. PPE has doubled. Again, anytime your PPE is growing slower than your overall growth in the business, that's a good sign. You have had some growth in your goodwill, so there has been some slow and steady acquisitions taking place here, but nothing huge compared to the overall size of the business long-term debt. You've increased your long-term debt a lot, right? So your long-term debt is up 7x and you've gone from a point where your long-term debt was below your PP&E to now your long-term debt is a billion dollars above the PP&E. So one of the things you've benefited from, benefited from over the last decade in terms of boosting this return on equity is you're taking on cheap debt to kind of be a bigger part of the overall management of your business. You've adjusted your capital structure. That's really a one-time adjustment. You're not going to be able to repeat that over the course of decades and decades where you keep leveraging up. Now, they probably still have a little bit of room where they can continue to leverage the business, but it wouldn't be something I would count on in the future. So again, the seven X return in the EPS is probably not repeatable. We should expect our return in EPS to be closer to like a 10% growth instead of the amazing growth we've seen over the last decade. There needs to be some reversion to mean based upon what I'm seeing here. Uh, nothing unreasonable on the balance sheet though. Cash flow statement, you do have some stock-based compensation. It's only gone up 2x over the course of the decade from 29 million a year to 50 million a year. But most importantly, you have pretty steady buybacks. So your buybacks are outpacing your stock-based compensation each and every year, which is allowing you to have that steadily declining shares outstanding. I'm okay with stock-based compensation when it's fully offset by buybacks that are actually leading to a reduction in shares. So that's an okay setup as well. We can also see they're paying money into dividends, but they're spending a lot more of their cash flow on buybacks than they are on dividends. I actually prefer that. 
Um, I think the, the buybacks are probably a little bit more cre creative for you as a shareholder, especially at the prices that we're seeing here. One of the things that's interesting when I'm looking at this pp and &E, um, it looks like we're hovering pretty close to our depreciation and amortization, um, which is telling us that's probably a good estimate of our overall cash um, numbers. There's not a lot of distortion here from big depreciation numbers relative to cash flow from operations, which is a good sign, especially for a manufacturing industry. That might be something you would expect to see. So not seeing that and seeing that these numbers are hugging pretty close. You see like negative 150 here, negative plus 150 here in 2018. The fact that those numbers are really close is a good sign for you that you're kind of matching up well. You can see though, like in some years like this, when their cash flow from operations is not enough to cover their cash flow from investing, that's when they're taking on this debt. Um, kind of like to make those buybacks as well. So some of those buybacks are maybe not fully sustainable just on their own, but but something to be aware of. Um. <sighs> okay, so this is an interesting business. Um, one of the things that I, I'm struggling with on whether or not this should be an out, a watch list company. I really like the returns over the last decade. If I could have bought it a decade ago and held it till now, I would have done really, really well as a shareholder. Um, and I think you're, you might still have a really good future ahead of you. You have really strong growth rates here. Um, eight to eight to nine percent is a very good revenue growth rate. The concern is just like, I look at this period from 2016 to 2020, and I don't see a single year besides 2016 that's in that 8% range. You actually have four years in a row of 6%, 3.8, 5.1, 5.7. Now, 2021 was a really good year, 25% but it's distorting the overall 10 year Kager. And so your growth rate, I think might on a sustainable basis be a little bit lower than what it's showing here. Likewise, my EPS growth is not going to repeat this pattern because I've already used up a big gap here. So like the gap between the gross margin in 2012 and 2021 was 28%. But now that gap is only 21%. So we've already used up some of that gap with our operating leverage. Yes, there's still some incremental room that we could see, especially if we can boost this gross margin a little bit closer, keep pushing it closer to 40%. You could see some further operating leverage and expansion, but I do slightly worry that we've already taken the most, a lot of credit for that, that might not be replicable in the future. So for me, I don't know. This this is this is a good business. I like how stable it is. Um, I, what I want to do is I want to know more. I think it's a really good company based upon what I see here. It's definitely above average, but I would really like a ten percent growth rate, and I don't know if they have it. So for me, that's probably what's going to keep it off the back of my watch list. But I think it's a really interesting stock. It's a really interesting price. The valuation is probably undervalued for what you're getting. This is probably a stock that's a value stock today that has a strong growth rate, and you can probably get good ten to twelve percent returns off of it if you hold it for the long term. Um, I just would like a little bit more growth and maybe that's being greedy, maybe that's a mistake. I do have reasonable growth rates here. It is self-funding their growth. They have a lot of what I'm looking for. I just don't think I understand maybe the building products industry super well. Um, but overall though, it looks like a really good business. Um, and it could be one that I would regret missing out on in the future. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to check out the best stocks that I've found, the ones that hit all my metrics, that's the watch list playlist up above. I think you'll enjoy some of those videos in there. And if you want to check out this software that I'm using, quickfs.net, it's the first link in the description below. That is my um, affiliate link that I use to recommend their service. Please consider using my link. It's a great way to support the channel. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.